So in January 2010, um, I was introduced to uh, a home away from home. I just didn't know it at the time. That place was the Syrian Golan, or otherwise known as the Golan Heights, depending on who you're speaking to. Um, and for those that aren't aware, the Golan is a part of Syria that has been under Israeli occupation since 1967. It's a small area of land, um, to some it may seem insignificant, but if you are from the Syrian Arab community that is being discriminated against there, um, it's, it's their homeland. It's their, where um, families come together and spend time. And simply, put, to put it simply, Israel has occupied that area for a number of reasons. It's a strategic standpoint, as you can see, you have Lebanon, you have Syria, you have Jordan to the south, and uh, Israel itself. It's also a place of affluent water source, and unfortunately, water is the new oil. It's uh, something that many places are fighting over, and that fight has been brought to the Golan. And it's a place of beauty as well. Um, it's a place that uh, the hospitality has no bounds. But unfortunately, the un there is an uh, undercurrent with that, and that undercurrent is the occupation. And I can't, I could fill an hour talking about the op occupation alone. I, um, I don't have the time to do that, so I'm going to try and take up a few points. The first one is nationality. Syria is their identity and it is being gradually eroded by Israel. The occupation has been going on for five decades now. And within that time, Israel has introduced laws um, at a domestic level. It has put in settlements. And all these things have been brought about to gradually erode away the Syrian identity that exists there in the hope that one day they will be able to legitimately take it. I should highlight that Everything that has been done to date is illegal under international law. That's not be, being controversial. That's the facts. The occupation is illegal. The introduction of settlements is illegal. And on that note, how they go about creating these settlements, they expropriate land. And I'm going to try and use it yeah, here. So from this standpoint, I was standing in a farmer's field. His crops had the previous year been ripped up to create this military trench here and this military road here. He was returning the following year to replant his crops on the side that we were standing, but he often longingly looked across the way at all this land that he had that he most probably would never be able to touch again. It's covered in landmines, it's patrolled by the, uh, the Israeli army, and it's covered in trenches and things, as you can see. And the rumor was that this was going to be the 34th set settlement um, to be built in the Golan. Aside from expropriating lands in 67, they also went through and just raised uh, two cities, 200 villages and farms, and started to build these settlements here. It all looks very pretty. Unfortunately, the Syrian Arabs were, who their population was severely depleted, they were pushed up into the northern part into five villages to reduce it from two cities and 200 villages and farms to just five villages with severe restrictions, landmines around them, and uh, to lose all of their farmland, just like that farmer that I was standing with. And the settlements, they'll be dotted all throughout the Golan, and they are put into strategic standpoints places that have good access to water, places that would provide a good place to host a winery, uh, places that would provide a good place to put together a water factory, Aden Water, um, the Golan Winery, um, things like that, which are sold as Israeli products. And as I said, the Arab population has been pushed right up into the five villages. The, there are severe restrictions. Um, the Israeli administration has been brought in, so everything has to go through Israel. They, if you want to build something, you need a building permit. If you want to plant something, you need access to your land. And discriminatory policies have been put in place to, in the hope it's um, thought to eventually push the Syrian Arabs out. 
um, in the hope of annexing the land. They have tried to do it. They have a law within their own domestic system, the Golan Heights Law of 1981, but it's not recognized, and nor should it be. Uh, what they are doing is illegal. And as you can see here, this is Majd al Shams. This is where I lived for just over three months and have um, had the honor of going back and visiting on a regular basis over the last three years. And these are children um, during the snow season playing out in their garden. That is their garden. That is their house. Just there. That is their garden. And this is a landmine field. And that's a common occurrence within the Arab villages. You won't see that around the settlement. And the other danger is that it looks very clear and marked out, but during the height of the so snow season, that will all be covered. And also with the, you can see here, it's very unsettled ground. The landmines, they move down, they move into gardens. They've caused 66 injuries over the last 40, 50 years. And uh, six, within that 16 deaths, eight of those have been children. And you can see how it happened. Another issue, one that is very close to my heart, is family separation. Uh, with the occupation, the Golanese were essentially um, cut off from the rest of Syria. And there's been a number of policies that have been introduced through the Red Cross and things to try and mitigate that um, to little success. And this is one example. This is Mother's Day in 2010. The Golanese gather at an uh, area called the Valley of Tears, which is very aptly named. And you can see here, this is Majd al Shams on the Golan side, and this is the Syrian side. There's just a, a football stadium full of their family. This is how they meet each other on Mother's Day. Um, I was away from my own mother, but I had the option. I could have paid that extortionate price to get home to her on that day. They simply don't. This is the reality. Speaking to each other through tannoys, looking at each other through any apparatus that they can possibly find. There is the opportunity, if you're one of the lucky few, to go into Syria for a few days. There's categories that have been set up um, which have expanded over time, but even if you fit in with that cat into one of those categories, there's no, uh, no certainty that you're going to be able to get across. You may be issued a permit, you might not be. Even if you are issued a permit, there's no guarantee that the border soldiers are going to let you across. This lady, um, Hannah, um, I interviewed her uh, two, two, three years ago. She is holding a photo of her mother and her brother. She's originally from a little town in Syria, and her mother remains in Syria. And unfortunately, her brother, seen in this photo, died a few days before this photo was taken. And why I'm telling you about Hannah is um, her story. She had applied for a permit to see her dying brother. They knew he was dying. They knew he was very sick. That permit was denied on the basis of security reasons. She then applied for a further permit, which costs money with no guarantees. Um, they're not a rich family. She applied for a permit to go to her brother's funeral. It again was denied on the basis of security reasons. Three weeks after that photo was taken, she applied again to go and support her mother, who had just lost her son. It was, guaranteed, uh, it was granted. Where did those security reasons go? And how Hannah had ended up in the Golan um, is a story similar to this lady here, Samar. She is what is known as a Syrian bride. Uh, this was, photo was taken in January 2011. She had to make a decision she had to decide, do I want to go with the man that I want to marry, or do I want to remain with my family? If you live in the Golan and want to marry someone in Syria, you have to move to Syria in order to do that. If you live in Syria and want to marry someone in the Golan, you have to move to the Golan in order to do that. There's no guarantee that you're going to be able to cross back over to see your family, as Hannah's previous story tells. This is supposed to be the happiest day of your life. This was her happiest day and the worst day of her life. And now, it's not only, only the occupation that is creating, as one of the interviewees said to me, um, our hearts are literally on fire every single day. The Syrian civil war has broken out. It broke out in March 2011. We're nearly two years in. 
there are the last figures, and they are going up day by day by day. These are old figures now, but the last figures that I came across, 37,000 people have died, 460,000 plus people have been made into refugees, and 2.1 million people have been displaced. It's a brutal war on both sides. Um, war crimes have been committed by both sides. Um, but up until August of 2012, thankfully, the war didn't have a physical impact on the Golan. That was until now. It's not that well covered in the media, um, and rightly so, Gaza took over um, a lot of the media, and that was rightly so. But during that time, it provided Israel an opportunity to sneakily um, launch at Syria. Um, this was due to Syrian mortars um, straying, as they say, into the Golan. Um, that's debatable. Um, but Israel did retaliate. They say that it's in defense. Um, that, again, is debatable. But this picture shows that there is the opportunity of the Golan, uh, the Golan becoming in involved in the war, a very, very brutal war. And what has this done to the community? It's divided it. The um, community doesn't really know where to stand on it. There's generally three um, sort of routes that have been taken. There's the one um, where people are saying, it's not our war. It's horrible what's happening, but it's not our war. There's the others, um, like the two top photos here. This photo was taken in October 2011, and this photo was taken in April 2012, and there have been protests since. You can see the amount of people there. Generally, the, these are community leaders here, Drew's community leaders. You can see there that they are coming out um, in favor of Assad. Don't judge them. Um, they are essentially living in fear. They're, they're unsure of what is to come. And this is a smaller, but just as important, uh, rally as such of um, people that are concerned about their relatives and friends that are currently in Syria. Unfortunately, the community has turned against them. They have been socially excluded. They have been uh, told, don't come to weddings at their rallies. They've had shoes thrown at them, which is a massive insult in that area. And through all of this, the fear comes from what is going to happen next. Is Assad going to win? Unlikely, but a possibility. Is he going to win? And if so, if he sees us coming out against him, is he going to forget about us? These people want to return to Syria. They don't want to be under Israeli occupation. They also don't want to be violated against if, they, if a move is made for them to return to Syria. Also, what if a replacement government comes in? What if Assad does fall? What's going to happen to us then? These are a Druze minority, and they fear they're seeing what's going on in Egypt, um, where minorities are being forgotten. They fear that. And they're also fearing we don't want, as I said, we don't want to be part of the occupation anymore. We want our homeland back. So unfortunately, I wish I could end on a happier note, but unfortunately it comes back to the title of this talk, which is that they are essentially caught between a rock and a hard place.